So as I mentioned, this course is called Security Evaluation Methodologies. And so what does that actually mean? So the main idea of this course is, let's say you graduate, you get a job. Uh, hopefully you're in security now that you're doing a specialization in security. Uh, so you show up on the first day of your job and you're now the security person. And so your new boss hands you something and says, is it secure or not? Okay. Uh, and so how would you go about evaluating uh, whether that is actually secure or not? Okay, so that's the sort of high level promise of the course. Now the challenge, as we'll see, is there's really no way for you to uh, take some recipe that you follow uh, and you're just going to execute these five steps and then you'll say, yes, that's secure. No, that's not secure. Okay. Uh, so security isn't that clean uh, in terms of how you evaluate it. Yeah. Is it same as penetration testing? Uh, so let's use that as an example. So penetration testing is a methodology. So this course is, is about methodologies in general. So one methodology might be pen testing, right? So pen testing is, if you don't know, it's in terms of network security. Uh, so you have a server, you have known vulnerabilities, uh, you run them, uh, the known vulnerabilities basically against the server. You try and see uh, whether any of them uh, lead to an exploit uh, of the server. Yeah. But there is many guidelines like OS and famous like MITRE or something, so they can guide you at some, at some, in some way to get, uh, conduct a evaluation of your, let's say, web application or your network security. So uh, we can consider those as an option? Yes, yeah. Follow? Okay, so the comment is that there, there are existing methodologies, so like Web3 or whatever will put out uh, different uh, um, uh, guidelines that, uh, that you can use, and they have sort of checklists of things. Uh, they might have some automated tools uh, that let you uh, test uh, whether your software, like your website in this case, is, is vulnerable to certain known vulnerabilities, you know, cross-site scripting or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that is a methodology as well. So what was the thought process that went into writing down what those rules are, what the recommendations are? Um, that, that's sort of the topic of this course. So like, how, how is it that they ended up with these lists of guidelines? Yeah. Okay, now one of the challenging aspects of security, and one of the reasons that, that, that for example, these uh, recipes, they work great if you have a website, right? But what if you don't have a website? What if you have a piece of hardware, like a chip, right? Then what are you going to do, right? So then maybe there is some methodology for hardware as well. Okay, but essentially you need for everything that you might think of what's the security of this thing, you need some methodology that matches it. Okay, and there's not going to be a general recipe that works for everything, right? So the same recipe that works for pen testing a server isn't going to work for looking at a hardware based chip trying to decide whether it can be reverse engineered, for example. Okay, so one of the main challenges of this course as the course almost over promises, right? It says you're going to walk out and be able to evaluate the security of everything. That's absolutely not the case, okay? You really have to be a domain expert in what you're evaluating, unfortunately, to really do a good job of trying to decide whether it's secure or not, okay? But what we will do is we will try to teach you some general techniques uh, that you can use to at least get started. Uh, and we'll do some deep dives on some different protocols. So I'll, I'll kind of make you experts in specific areas in order to show how an expert would use a certain methodology. Um, so for example, we'll spend a lot of time on something called HTTPS. This course has nothing to do with it. Like I could have picked any example, but it's just a nice example. And we'll spend like three weeks on looking at this protocol. And not because I want you to learn about the protocol, but because I want you to see the technique that's involved called an attack tree. And I, I want you to really see it on a real example, not like some trivial example, but like on something that, that requires a lot of domain knowledge. Um, so, so anyways. Um, okay, so the challenge, uh, the first challenge, I guess, of methodologies is that there's too many areas of security, right? So what are some of the areas of security? So we talked about, I mentioned hardware, websites was mentioned, uh, servers. Uh, so those are three. Uh, is there any others that people can think of? Just shout out whatever you think. Okay, operating systems. So let's let's put software kind of together. So you have like web applications, phones, databases, operating systems, servers. Uh, networking could be its own thing. So that involves servers, but then you have network protocols and whether 
you know, networks are secure in terms of integrity and uh, reliability and whether messages are confidential, if they're supposed to be confidential, that kind of thing. Uh, hardware could include IOTs, like chips, uh, cars, I don't know, uh, that kind of thing. What else? Okay, wireless devices would fit as well. So uh, that would fit under hardware, maybe. Yeah. Like building access systems? Okay, great. So the more classical security thing. So like this room, right? There's locks on this room. Uh, there's some lock that stops everyone from using the projector. Uh, there's some software that stops me from projecting my screen. Uh, uh, so yeah, so it's like physical access. Uh, so that's another important aspect of security. And so if you go to security conferences, it's not all talks about servers, like sometimes you are picking locks, right? Or like taking a lock picking course or, or something like that. Military stuff? Yeah, okay, yeah. So that, that falls under it as well. So you can think like national security, uh, national defense, government level security. Sure, sure, sure. So that's like telecom, but like large scale, expensive projects, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of security that go into uh, like really expensive stuff, like sending rockets into space or doing satellites and things like that as well. Uh, airplanes, um, you know, physical, uh, like large, you know, uh, uh, large, large things like that. And then you have a lot of re reliability guarantees as well, right? So you don't want the security system of the airplane to interfere. Uh, with its ability to safely uh, fly people. Uh, and so, yeah, so that would be another example. Anyone have any other ideas? Say again. Data security. Okay, so data, so you can think more at the informational level, right? So forget about whether it's on a software or on hardware or going across a network. What about like the data itself, right? So things like encryption uh, could come into play or signing data for integrity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so data privacy. Um, so you can think of, uh, yeah, what's, what data is being collected about you in databases, um, what, uh, what can be inferred uh, from that data, who's that data shared with, um, you know, those, those are all aspects as well. Okay, uh, do you say elections? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there are uh, real use cases. So I actually did a lot of work on voting systems. That was one of my main research areas. Uh, and so yeah, there's a lot of different uses. So you might think of commerce or finance. What's the security of that? What about voting? There's a voting thing coming out. What about the vaccine passport, right? Like that's coming out. What's the security uh, with it? What's the privacy aspect? I may make you do assignment one on that, but I haven't, I haven't fully thought out the assignment. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's another aspect. Anything else? Traffic security, whatever. Like, if you do this encryption instead of this encryption, like, uh, let's say ADS or GDS or. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so uh, it, going back to encryption, that's at the data level. But things like traffic, also the cars themselves. Sometimes we call this cyber physical. Uh, so there's software, but but it actually makes changes in the physical world. Could be electricity plant. Uh, so things are controlled. Could be a nuclear fusion. Uh, plant or something like that. Um, yeah. Finance, avoiding double spending attacks. And sure. Finance. Yeah, so that's another research area of, of mine personally, but that's another use case. Uh, so there's lots in, in terms of uh, finance. Yeah, exactly. Double spending, uh, making sure that payments are, uh, when they're made, they're final, making sure that I can't lie about the payments I made in the past. Uh, those, those are properties. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that uh, to some extent in this course. Say again. Digital currencies. Digital currencies, yeah. So that would fall under the same umbrella. Yeah, cyber, or, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum. If you want to learn about that, uh, take my course next term. Uh, so I'll teach INSC 6630, and it will be on blockchain technology, Bitcoin. Whoops. Sometimes I get excited and I <laughs> knock my microphone over, or I like. Okay, so I've heard, actually I've heard all of the things I have in the notes. I actually turned the screen off purposely so you wouldn't cheat. Whoops. And so these are, you've said all of the things except for one. Okay, so it's still not on the screen, uh, the, the one that you didn't say. 
Uh, there's one other aspect, and this is actually something that we'll focus a, a fair bit on uh, in this course because it's not really covered very well in the other courses that you'll, you'll take. So uh, assuming that you're in the ISS program, you're going, to take, you're going to learn about software security and operating system security. You're going to take a whole course on network security. Uh, you're going to take a whole course on cryptography. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects uh, that you're going to learn. Uh, but one thing uh, that's right now, it's actually probably the kind of hottest area or the most important area is, say again? No, no. Anyone else? Okay, perfect. So people, right? Uh, so humans, right? Uh, so humans are, are critical uh, to the system. So if a human doesn't do uh, what they're supposed to in terms of security, then that presents a vulnerability. So you might write the best security software. It might have the best security you know, properties and provisions. Uh, but if the human can't use it, right, uh, then, then you're in trouble, right? Then, then you, you might as well not have that security software at all. Right? If, if the human user can't use it, uh, they make mistakes using it, they turn it off because it's annoying or because it slows them down, uh, then it's, it's basically as good as not having, uh, not having that security at all. Uh, social engineering is another thing. So if you want access, say you want to break into a server room, you can do it digitally, you can try some sort of network attack, or you could just show up dressed in the uniform of an IT person and ask for access because you're there to repair the server and, and, and do whatever you want. Um, and so, yeah, so social engineering we'll spend a lot of time on, not a lot, but, but it will be a focus. We'll spend like one or two lectures on it and usability uh, and how you evaluate whether systems are usable or not uh, is another topic that we'll spend uh, one or two lectures on. Okay, so the uh, the, the next thing is, uh, here's a, a sort of a set of points for why this course is hard to teach, I guess you could say. Um, so the first thing is that evaluation itself is hard uh, because there's not a single methodology that's going to work for all of these things, right? So if your boss at your new job comes to you and says, we have this procedure for like how employees can enter the building, right? And we want to make sure there aren't loopholes uh, in that procedure, right? You can't do pen testing to do that. Actually, pen testing is almost like close enough. It's kind of the same methodology, but you can't do cryptographic attacks, right? Or you're not going to do a crypto proof uh, that, 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 that these procedures are done correctly, okay? Uh, yeah, and if you look at hardware, it's going to be different than software. And it's really in these like sort of softer areas like policies and people and procedures and things like that where security actually gets not well defined. So the, almost the more technical it is, the better like the security principles are and the better evaluation methodologies we have. Um, but when you have these sort of softer areas of security, uh, that's where you start to see gaps uh, in terms of, of how well that uh, we can do. So I'm going to try and focus in this course on those sort of gap areas myself. Okay, uh, the second point is that uh, you, can't, if you don't know anything about digital currencies, you might know a lot about security. You've taken lots of courses and you've taken this course and so you know about security evaluation methodologies, but you don't know anything about digital currencies, you're not gonna sit and three days later tell me whether a new digital currency is secure or not, right? Like there's no escaping the fact that you need to have domain knowledge of what you're evaluating, right? So normally you would have to like understand what's going on. Like security is a secondary thought. The first thing is just like, how does this work? What's the functionality of this? How does it actually work? And then once you understand the functionality, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then you can start uh, thinking about its security. Sorry, it's not COVID, I don't think. I just uh, <laughs> didn't bring water, uh, which I normally do, but. Um, Okay, so, so having some in-depth knowledge uh, makes it hard as well. Okay, the final thing is uh, kind of the most philosophical point I guess we'll make in the whole course, um, but it's, I'll just state it. So security is necessary, but not sufficient. So what does this mean? It means that you will never be able to say that something is secure, okay? All you can say at the end of the day is, I know about all of these attacks and it's secure against these attacks, okay? So there, you know, take the pen testing example. It's a great example, right? There's, here's a thousand things that people have tried in before. I tried them all on this and it doesn't work, right? So it's secure against this, against that history of past thoughts. 
Does that mean that no one will come up with a brand new attack that no one's thought of and break your system? Doesn't mean that, right? So security is kind of a negative concept as opposed to a positive concept. It, it tells you what doesn't happen. It, it doesn't, if you do this attack, it doesn't break. If you do this attack, it doesn't break. But it can't tell you, you can't prove that it will do some positive thing for you. Like it will always protect this data or it will always uh, you know, be reliable or, or whatever uh, the positive thing is uh, that you want to say about it, okay? So it's really hard to, uh, so anyways, the good news about this is if you're in the security field, you'll never be out of a job uh, because there's always going to be new attacks. People will think of new things. Uh, then you have to rerun all of your analysis with the new information and you have to look at all the systems that you've looked at before with like this fresh new attack uh, in place. And yeah, attacks get better over time is, is what we observe. And uh, it, you, know, you know, people sometimes have theoretical attacks or there's like a break, but it's not that serious. Can't do anything interesting with it, but give it two, three years and people will combine it with other attacks or uh, people will find ways to make it more efficient. And then all of a sudden it becomes a, an important attack that everyone has to consider. Um, so yeah, so security is, is sort of, uh, your, your job's never finished uh, when, when you deal with security. Okay, any questions so far on any of this or comments? This can be interactive too, don't feel that you have to uh, only ask questions to, to clarify what you've heard. Okay, so what we'll do at the start of the course is the first couple of lectures, I'm gonna show you three really high level evaluation methodologies, okay? So high level that they're almost not useful, okay? <laughs> but if you have it combined with domain knowledge of what you're talking about, it can be useful. You can also think of it as a start. It's a way you need to start somewhere. And so it gives you, um, it gives you yeah, basically a, a starting point. You can think of it as brainstorming exercise uh, it gives you something to do on day one. So day one, your, your employer gives you something and says, is it secure? You can say, well, maybe I could use Stride or an attack tree or something like that. And it gives you something to do anyways until you uh, figure out exactly what, how you want to evaluate it. Um, so the three really high level of, uh, methodologies, uh, the one's called Stride. Stride is a recipe. Uh, it basically says, here's six things uh, that, that are often uh, considered when you consider uh, attacks against systems, they usually fall in one of six categories. Uh, so these are the six categories, and why don't you think about whether these categories apply uh, to whatever it is that you're looking at, okay? Um, an evaluation framework is used strictly for comparing multiple solutions. So someone might hand you one thing and say, is it secure? Then stride is, is appropriate. Someone might hand you two things and say, which one's more secure? Okay, so that's a slightly different question. Right? And so you need a comparative uh, framework as opposed to, to just evaluating a single thing. So the evaluation framework is, is what we'll look at for comparing different alternatives uh, to, to trying to solve the same problem. Uh, and then attack tree is, is like stride. Maybe I should order it differently, but I do attract tea trees at the end because I, I spend more time on them. Uh, but they're kind of like stride in the sense that they, they let you start thinking about how you're going to attack a system uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a methodology like Stride that you apply to a single solution. So you have one thing that you're looking at and you're thinking about how you're going to break it. Okay, so Stride itself, like I say, it's, it's, uh, um, it's basically the six major categories that attacks fall into. Um, there wasn't earlier classification called CIA, you still see it in some security courses. CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, and so Stride basically says, uh, we'll keep those three, they're good, uh, but they're not good enough, we need another three. Uh, and so it introduces three on top of that, and it changes the, the names of them confusingly so, so that they're no longer CIA, they're something else you'll see in a second. Uh, what they are, but uh, those those three map onto three of the six Stride properties, and then there's three extras. Uh, Stride comes from Microsoft Research, uh, and so there's a textbook as well. It's one of the uh, recommended readings, but not something that you have to read uh, for this course. You just have to understand the material in the lecture itself. But if you looked at that, you would see that oh yeah, there's like a hundred-page textbook on just Stride. 
uh, and, and it covers attack trees and a few other things. It's, a, it's actually a really nice book. Um, but, but, but anyway, so this is like a serious uh, thing. It's not just something that someone came up with in the shower and then put on a blog post or something like that. Um, OK, so without further ado, uh, this is Stride itself. So we have uh, spoofing. Whoops. OK, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. Sometimes I, I always call it escalation of privilege. They're, they're kind of interchangeable terms. Um, OK, so let's go through these and, and try to understand uh, what each of them are. So the first thing that Stride does that's a little different than CIA is CIA tells you the positive property. So you want confidentiality. You want your messages to be secure. Stride is from the perspective of the attacker. So if Confidentiality is the property you want. What's the attack? The attack is that you break confidentiality. So in this case, they call it information disclosure. So information disclosure is the attack, and then confidentiality is the property that's being breached. So these six ones are, are all phrased in terms of the attack itself. Uh, you can see that tampering corresponds to integrity in CIA. Uh, information disclosure uh, corresponds to confidentiality in CIA and denial of service corresponds to availability. And then there's three, spoofing, repudiation, and escalation of privilege that are not um, part of the original CIA. Okay, so let's uh, go through them one by one. So spoofing is um, impersonating something or someone else, okay? So you say that you're somebody else. So think of the social engineering example. So you show up at a company, you're dressed like an IT worker, but you're not actually an IT worker and you want access to it, okay? So that's a form of spoofing attack. Now, spoofing is easy to think in terms of humans, but it can also be in terms of uh, digital things as well, right? It could be a computer, I spoof your MAC address or I spoof your IP address. Uh, not, I phrase that wrong, like I would spoof my own uh, IP address. Uh, maybe, uh, so for example, in Concordia, if I want to plug into the networks, uh, Every network fork has a MAC address, and it only talks to that MAC address, right? So if I want to work on my laptop on this internet connection that's going into this computer that I'm sitting in front of, I would have to figure out the MAC address of this. Then I'm going to put it on my laptop, and then hopefully I'll get access uh, to the network. Otherwise, it won't work, OK? So that's spoofing. Um, it could be a file, right, uh, that's on your computer. So maybe I'm going and I'm looking up. Maybe I'm, I'm the operating system of your computer. I'm looking at the permissions. Uh, for to in order to do something, okay, and then uh, you're somehow able to insert a fake file there that has fake permissions, and I believe it. I believe it's real. Um, one small thing uh, that I have a note of that comes up in spoofing is uh, there's a set of attacks uh, with a funny acronym T O C U T O U, uh, which means time of check versus time of use. Um, so time of check versus time of use is uh, is a general it, anyways, it, it's, it's one example of spoofing that comes up a lot. You see these kinds of vulnerabilities a lot, so I thought I'd just showcase it. So let me give you a really silly example. Um, let's say that you uh, want to go to the bar and you're not over 18 in Quebec, okay? But good news, you have a friend and, and they're over 18 or whatever, okay? Uh, so what you do is you go up to the, it's a club, so there's a security guard, so you go up to the security guard. You have your friend show their ID. The security guard checks the ID, they look at the face of the person, and they say, okay, they look at the birth date, and the birth date matches, okay? So they perform the check, and then they go to hand back the ID, and somehow you're able to jump into the position where your friend is standing, and you take the ID back instead, and then the security guard says, okay, you go, go into the club. Okay, now that sounds stupid, it's absurd, because you couldn't jump into that position fast enough without the security guard noticing, okay? But there was a difference here between uh, the time I checked, and then there was a bit of a gap, and then there was the time that I granted you access or permission to do what you were uh, supposed to do. So I was able to jump in and spoof at that moment. Now, while it sounds crazy in terms of humans doing this, in the digital world, that's, there's no constraint there, right? So an operating system might do a check, and then uh, operating systems get interrupted all the time, right? So they go off and they do something else. And then when they come back, the thing that they checked has been completely replaced, 
uh, for example. Question? Is it same as delegating? Uh, delegating is slightly different. Um, so delegating would be, uh, um, I have permission to do something, so I want to give you permission uh, to do it. And so delegation is an attack. This is an attack. Delegation is a property that you would want from systems, but then there are attacks that are associated uh, with delegation as well. So it's slightly different, but related. Yeah. Email spoofing, uh, yeah, so, so that's another example of, of spoofing itself. So that's not really time of check versus time of use, but it is, uh, going back to this, uh, an example of, of um, spoofing itself. So uh, for example, in email, for the longest time, uh, you could basically pretend to be any email address you wanted. So, if you wanted a, an email to appear as being sent from j.clark at concordia.ca, which is my email address, you could send that to a friend of yours and you could put that in you know, the from field and, and then it would show up at your friend's email client in Gmail as if it came from me, okay? Uh, now there's better security uh, around that and so there are certain protocols uh, that are in place that, that make that a lot harder uh, to do. And so it's going to depend on your client itself, but but that's one example. Another is telephone spoofing. So you get you know calls from telemarketers, and they might be somewhere else in the world, but yet the number is coming up as a local number, and so it's just a spoofed uh, spoofed number. Okay, uh, tampering. Uh, so tampering is uh, where you actually go and you modify uh, something. So you change something. So something is supposed to be a certain way, and you're actually changing it itself. Um, so it could be data or code as the example that's given. So that's that's a very sort of easy example. So data would be like, say the email's going across the wire and I change the message inside the email, right? Then it shows up at your email client and it's been changed. Okay, so that would be an example of integrity, sorry, of, of tampering. Integrity is the property uh, that, that's being violated. It could be software or something like that. Like say I install malware on your computer, uh, that, that would be an example of tampering. Uh, it could be something physical, right? You have a voting machine and it's not supposed to leak uh, how you voted, but somehow I'm able to tamper with it. And so when you vote for Alice, it records the vote for Bob. And because I physically put some electronic device on it or I pulled out the one chip and replaced it with the other chip or I added Wi-Fi capability so I can like monitor what you're doing, uh, whatever the case may be. Okay, so that's, that's tampering. Uh, we'll talk about tampering with humans uh, as well uh, in social engineering, so that, that's another aspect. Uh, okay, the next one is uh, repudiation. Uh, so the flip side of it is, is non-repudiation. This one's kind of weird, uh, but basically uh, repudiation says you deny having done something that you actually did do. Okay, so you go, you do something, you make a payment and you receive, like I buy something off of Amazon and the thing comes, it's in my house, I have it, but yet I go call up Amazon support and say, uh, I never received it, right? It got lost in the mail, okay? Uh, so that would be an example of repudiation. Uh, so I deny it. And in this case, Amazon would probably refund me if I do it once, but if I do it 10 times, then they're not gonna refund me anymore. Uh, and they might start investigating me. Um, so yeah, I, it could be I didn't send that email, I, I didn't modify that file, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, okay, information disclosure is basically leaking information that should be private. So there's some information, and privacy is sort of a weird concept. Uh, one way to think about it is just in terms of access. So like, some people have access to the data and some people don't, okay? So privacy is usually never like a, a fully binary thing where it's like, okay, that's something that like nobody knows. Right? Like think of your medical records. It's like most people don't know about it, but your doctors or some people know about it. Some people are able to add to it, but they're not able to see like what your past history is. Uh, some people can see everything. Uh, sometimes you need to authorize it. Uh, but if I'm unconscious, I can't authorize it. So I want it to be available, you know, even if I don't authorize it. Right. And so there's different access control rules that you could write about data. Um, so information disclosure is a breach of confidentiality. Now, sometimes it's a little more like we'll talk later about cookies, for example, in the context of, of web security and how they're used for tracing. And so that's like something that's that's a little harder to kind of put your finger on. And, and it's more of a general privacy uh, consideration. And so 
Uh, information disclosure, yeah, it can take different forms. Sometimes it's, it's like you're reading something that you shouldn't read, it's very clear cut. But in other cases, it's sort of, you know, in terms of like a broader kind of concept like privacy. Uh, denial of service uh, is basically trying to stop someone from accessing something uh, that they have. Um, so you might, you know, the, the, the main example, I guess, is, is the denial of service that you think of in terms of internet servers. Uh, so you want to bring down a website. Uh, so you have, you're, you start spamming it with as much traffic as you can. Uh, but the website probably has bigger pipes than you, and so you get all your friends to join in. Uh, so that's called yeah. distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. And even now, that might not be enough. Maybe they're behind Cloudflare or something like that. Uh, there's another form uh, that you can do that's a little more advanced, which is kind of fun. I'll just I'll give you a taste of, of this. Like using IoT, or? Uh, slightly different. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yes, so it, it combines reflection. Uh, so it's called an amplification attack. So traditionally with denial of service in the server case, uh, you would have a user and the user would direct as much traffic as they can at the website and hopefully the website stays up, okay? Uh, the main thing to, to understand is that uh, if real users are accessing your website, you have no way of telling the difference, right? So you, you have to service everyone, even if it's just to throw the packet away because it's, it's not formed. But like if you, uh, can't keep up with the incoming traffic, then you're denying your real users access to your server as well because you can't you can't tease them apart unless if there's some like telltale sign like all the bad traffic's coming from a certain geographic area, then maybe there's something you can do uh, to do it. But anyways, um, so originally that was denial of service. Then it was you get all your friends uh, to join in, uh, and that's called distributed denial of service. Uh, the latest kinds of attacks we see is slightly different. It's called amplification attacks. Uh, it, it involves uh, reflection. And this is kind of cool because it combines spoofing uh, as well as uh, denial of service. So the ultimate goal is denial of service, uh, but it uses spoofing uh, as a method in order to do it. And so the basic approach is um, there's some protocols uh, on the internet that run over, most, most of the internet runs on TCP. Okay, so TCP is a network protocol that allows two parties to connect to each other. Uh, it, pro it provides reliability. So if packets get dropped, uh, the receiver is going to notice it. There's some checks, and then they're going to ask for those uh, packets to be sent again, uh, and then those packets will be sent again. Uh, an alternative to TCP is called UDP. Uh, UDP is used uh, for, like, say, say you're on Zoom, okay? Maybe there's packets that are being dropped, but by the time you realize they're dropped and you ask for it again, like the, the audio and the video has like moved on. So even if you get those packets, but they're a second late, there's no way for you to like go back and put them in the right place. Unless if you have like one second delay or like buffering or something like that. Um, so generally with UDP, you just spam it as fast as you can and, uh, and you hope it gets through. And if it doesn't get through, it gets dropped and it's not critical uh, that it gets dropped. So. Um, some stuff that's, that's really traffic heavy uses UDP. Uh, also like little requests where you can always ask again. If you don't get an answer right away, you just ask again. Maybe the packet got dropped, whatever. Um, okay, now the thing about UDP is because they don't do a handshake uh, between the two parties, uh, you don't actually know who you're talking to, okay? And so if someone sends you a request over UDP, what they can do is they can spoof the IP address and they could say, actually this request is coming from someone else. Okay, so let's just think through that. So let's say that you have Alice. This is where I would prefer to be able to draw this out. But anyways, let's say you have Alice and she sends a UDP request to Bob. Uh, so Bob's going to respond uh, to Alice, okay? But Alice could do, what she could do is she could say, actually, I'm Carol. So Alice is sending a UDP, UDP request to, or it's not a request, it's just traffic uh, to Bob saying that she's Carol. Okay, so Bob will receive it thinking he got it from Carol, and then he'll send the response back to Carol. Okay, now in TCP, this won't happen. In TCP, what will happen is Alice will say, I'm Carol, and Bob will say, hi, Carol, I'm Bob, and Carol will say, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Like, you're, you're trying to tell me you're Bob, but like, I didn't ask you who you were, okay? So because there's a handshake, uh, basically the protocol would fall apart at that point. But with UDP, uh, you can spoof the IP address that it's coming from. Uh, and then when you send the data, the person's going to respond to the IP address that they received, okay? 
as if that was who it came from. Okay, so the nice thing that you could do, not nice, maybe not nice thing that you can do, um, is what you could do is you could pick a website that you want to bring down, okay? And you could find like some server on the internet. Uh, you might go looking like in the real backbone of the internet. So like one that like has been patched up for many years now, but was sort of the big example of, of these kinds of attacks, you know, maybe five years ago uh, was something called NTP. So NTP is network time protocol. Uh, it's basically uh, servers, you know, they want to know the timing of things because packets get dropped and they want to know like how long it's been and you know having to know like what time it is is, is important and because the internet's distributed a bunch a bun, amongst a bunch of different computers they all have different times okay so what almost every server that was on the internet offered is they offered a server where service where you could come up to the server and just say what time is it and they would say okay it's this is the time okay uh, and so the idea was that like if you want synchronized clocks or something like that uh, then you would be able to do it so almost all servers had this functionality uh, turned on. So you could go to any of these servers and, and ask uh, what time it is. Now you could also ask for other stuff too. So you could be like, what time is it? Like, who are the last, I don't know, 100 people who have connected to you? Uh, and there, there were different things that this protocol supported. And so this, uh, this uh, server would reply uh, with all the information. Okay. Now let's put two ideas together. Okay. The one idea is that you can spoof an IP address. So what I could do is say, I'm Alice, I could go to Bob and say, what time is it? But say, I'm Carol, right? I'm, I'm really Alice, but I'm Carol, what time is it? Then Bob's going to send the time to Carol, okay? So big deal. Um, so let's say I want to do a, a denial of service. I could do it like indirectly that way. So I could reflect it uh, being, uh, so if I want to take down Carol's computer, I just go to Bob and say, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it? And Bob says it's, you know, uh, it's 1924, 1924, 1924 to Carol, okay? But basically, as fast as I can ask Bob for the time, that's as fast as Bob is going to hit Carol with traffic, okay? So I might as well just send traffic to Carol directly. Like, it's not helping me to route it through Bob, okay? But here's the second key idea. What if asking for what time it is is really small? I can do it really fast because it's really small, but the response is really big. Let's say the response is 10 times bigger than the request. Then if I'm hitting it at a certain rate and that server can keep up, it's responding to Carol with 10 times the rate. Okay, it's sending 10 times uh, the amount of traffic. Okay, so I could be a small computer with like, or a small like internet connection with not a lot of bandwidth but if I can hit one of these backbone internet servers that have a ton of bandwidth because they're critical infrastructure to the internet and get them to send a response that's 10 or 100 times larger, right? Then, uh, then they, they'll, they'll send a lot of traffic uh, to Carol. So you can see this sort of depicted. So Alice is basically hammering the server as fast as she can with a small amount of traffic and she spoofs the website's uh, IP address uh, in terms of the response. And uh, so that's sort of depicted here. I guess I can't remember since I drew this last time. But um, actually, don't no, ignore the, the stuff in pink for now. So Alice is hitting the, the uh, server, and the server is amplifying it you know, 10 times to so 100 times as big. And so the website is, is getting hammered. Okay. Then what you can do is you can go back, and you can go back to the distributed denial service and get your friends to do the same thing. Okay, so you get all of your friends to pick their favorite NTP server. You all pick a different server so you're not overloading that one server. And all of you are amplifying all of your traffic and it's all going to the website. Okay, and then, and then that could uh, bring that website down. So NTP was kind of the classic example. DNSSEC is another protocol that runs over UDP. It, you can say, you know, give me the domain name for um, this IP address. And now because there's all these signatures involved, so DNSSEC is the secure version, you're getting this huge blob of data back. There's all these certificates and things like that. So your request is really small and you're getting something that could be like, like 10 or 100 times bigger uh, than the request back. So that's another uh, aspect of it. But okay, anyways, that, that was just for fun. I like to show uh, different attacks when I can. Uh, so let's go back to stride. So that's the now service. Um, the last uh, kind of attack is escalation of privilege or elevation of privilege. And so in this kind of attack, you 
uh, can think of a system where you have permissions in place. So different people are allowed uh, to do certain things and certain people are not allowed uh, to do certain things. Uh, and what you're able to do is you're able to find some way to circumvent uh, that access structure. So you're able to get permissions that you shouldn't have uh, somehow. So for example, um, well, the example that's given is like, think of your computer. I, I don't know, I haven't used Windows in a long time, but um, it used to be like you have super users and a min and things like that. On Linux or on OS, there, there's like a super user or a min access. And so let's say you're installing software. Uh, you might be able to install it as a user, but you might need, if it's doing like deep changes to the uh, system, to the kernel, uh, then you have to give it permission. So you might have to type in your password or something like that. But operating systems are really big, they're complicated, there's lots of people asking and there's different you know, ways of handling different requests. And, and so what happens is someone finds a way uh, where they can install software on your computer without the computer asking your permission to do it. Right? Maybe even from a website. So like you just go to a, a website and all of a sudden you get a rootkit that's installed on your computer that you should have to you know, download and it's gonna like walk you through the installation and make you type in the password and stuff. But somehow it's just, it's just happening. Okay, so that's a classic escalation of privilege. Uh, you might think of the uh, lock screen on your phone. Uh, so this now has gotten a lot of attention, but when iPhones first came out, like the first versions of iOS, there were all sorts of ways where you could bypass the lock screen. So you pick it up and you would, I don't know, turn the camera on and then press three buttons or like you do some weird thing uh, and then it would crash and then it would kind of reboot without the lock screen or like, or like the lock screen would just disable or I don't know, you make an emergency call and then hang up and then it would bump you back into like the unlocked phone as opposed to the locked phone. I don't remember the exact concrete examples, but um, that's an example of escalation of privilege. Okay, so the, that vulnerability shouldn't be there, but yet somehow it is there. Uh, so escalation of privileges show up in uh, procedures. And so we'll spend some time uh, on procedures. I'll show you one attack, for example, on, in terms of airport security. So let's say you're on a no-fly list, you're not allowed to fly. Uh, that's a permission that you don't have. But what if I told you there was a way with like a certain combination of showing different IDs to different people uh, where you could fly even though you're on the no flight list? That would be an escalation of privilege attack. So I'll show you an example of that that doesn't work anymore because it's like 10 years old, but anyways. Okay, uh, actually before I scroll too far, uh, uh, is there questions about Stride, about any of these or comments? Uh, for example, talking about DLL. So let's say I have a DLL. Let's say an executable uses a certain DLL, and I inject a DLL that comes in the first priority, let's say in directory, current directory where the, execu the executable is being executed. So actually, I'm spoofing the original DLL with my own. So is it considered spoofing or not? Or yeah, yeah. So if you, it depends, I guess, on what. What's supposed to stop that from happening? So the two that come to mind is it could be spoofy and also sounds like escalation of privilege, right? Because your DLL shouldn't have the permission to run if it came from a source that isn't like a legitimate source, right? Um, and so the question is, 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 so then you can look at the property that's being violated and say, okay, is this an authentication issue or is it an authorization issue? So is the operating system getting confused because it thinks you have one file, but it's, it's, it's mistaking your file for another file? Or is it an authorization issue where it's mistaking whether you have the permission to run or not? So in this case, it sounds like authentication, right? And so I would classify that as a spoofing attack, yeah. Um, so th these classifications aren't always perfect. So sometimes like attacks uh, fall, like they might fall into one of two categories uh, and it's not always like super clear cut uh, which category they fall into. The other thing is that most attacks combine lots of different steps, okay? And so uh, one thing I will promise you is there will be an exam question on the final exam that says, blah, blah, blah happen is that S, T, R, I, D, or E, okay? All right, so that's like a classic exam question, okay? So uh, be prepared for that. So um, like I say, sometimes they're not clear cut, so you, you have to like really think about it. And the other thing is you have to think about the actual attack itself and not the motivation for doing the attack. So like, for example, let's say I want to spy on you. That's like information disclosure, but I'm doing it by tampering with your phone, 
right? So it's sort of like, is that a tampering attack? Because I'm like, I'm doing the attack by tampering with your phone, but the goal of the attack is to spy on you and that's information disclosure. So which of the two is it? And so you always pick the one that's closest or most proximate to it. So I tampered with your phone, who cares why I'm doing it? The, I tampered with your phone, that's a tampering attack, okay? So the reason why, and I, I won't try to trick you on the exam, I'll try and give you like nice clear cut examples. And a lot of times I won't tell you the why, like why is the person doing this? But sometimes you, you get so smart and you're thinking ahead and you're like, well, they're doing this obviously because they wanna do this, right? And then you classify it in terms of what, what the attacker wants to do uh, as opposed to, 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 yeah. Anyway, so um, you can expect example or questions like that. I, uh, by the way, for the final exam, there are some sample questions on the website. And the course has changed so much since I wrote those sample examples, uh, it questions that, that they are almost useless. Uh, but I would say maybe 25% of them are still relevant. And there are a couple stride ones, but I also learned the hard way from writing them down that, that yeah, some, if, I'm not, if I'm not super careful myself, I can easily write down a proper, or a attack where it would have one of two uh, properties. So on the sample exam questions, there, there are a couple I think where you would get the mark if you either said it was tampering or you said it was escalation of privilege or whatever. It's usually tampering and escalation of privilege. Those are, are two that, that um, tend to be harder to separate. But anyways, I've gotten better through experience of writing exams. And so now I think I have, I'll, for your final exam, I'll come up with some new examples that I promise will be very clear cut and you'll have no question about which category they fall into. Okay, other uh, questions or comments about Stride? Okay, so Stride is fine. It's, uh, it's just a light uh, kind of brainstorming exercise uh, that you can use uh, if you want to. Um, uh, if, you, if you're just starting to think about security for the very first time, uh, then you can, um, uh, you can use Stride. Okay, so that's actually all I'm gonna say about Stride. We won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, I'll introduce you to the next example, but we won't have time to go through it uh, com completely. Uh, but we'll, we'll finish it up next class. Um, okay, so the next thing is called an evaluation framework. And so this is something that's useful uh, for comparing different alternatives. So if you have different things that do the same thing, or they promise to do the same thing, and you wanna compare them, uh, and generally, because it's a security course, you're thinking about which is most secure. So you can have that question in the back of your mind. So you're looking at five things, five different, I don't know, intrusion detection systems and you're trying to figure out which one is the most secure, okay? And the general principle from, lots of people do this, a lot of academics do it, there's lots of papers that have these now. And uh, the general thing that I've seen almost across the board is when you do this exercise, uh, you find that as economists say, there's no solutions, there's only trade-offs. Meaning that there's never a clear cut answer of like this is more secure than this. It's always, well, this is more secure but it's slower or it's, you know, whatever, there's some, it costs more, or it's more, it's harder to deploy, or whatever the case may be, okay? So there's always like different combinations of how secure something is. And it also depends on your properties. You might have 10 security properties, and this one's good for these five, but not good for the other five, and this one's, you know, another solution is good. So I'll show you an example of that uh, in, in a second. Um, evaluation framework looks really simple when you're done. Okay, so sometimes in your assignments, I'll make you do one. I haven't decided this year if I'll, I'll make you do one, but uh, it looks really simple. Um, but I promise you it's actually a lot, it's really hard to, to actually do, to get it into a nice clean solution. But anyways, what it looks like at the end is basically a simple chart, okay? So a chart will have a bunch of rows and the rows will be the different alternatives that you're comparing. And then you'll have a bunch of columns and the columns will say like, it's secure in this aspect, it's secure in this aspect, it's secure in this aspect. And then, you know, for each of the rows, you're gonna like get a grade. Or what I like to do, and I'll argue is, is, is a really simple approach is just like say whether it has a property or not. Does it satisfy the property or not? So you might, we'll use dots. So for example, we'll give it a dot if it, if it uh, satisfies it and there'll be an empty dot if it doesn't. And sometimes you're really nitpicky and you're like, well, it kind of half solves it, but doesn't fully solve it. So then you can throw a half dot at it, okay? But you can do a lot with just no dot, half dot, full dot, okay? So you don't have to do like really detailed analysis. But the, the, um, the, the main benefit of this, or the, the main thing that, that I'm trying to get you to do, 
uh, when you think about this is I want you to think beyond security. So I'm making it really easy to do the evaluations themselves, the individual evaluations, because I want you to consider lots of criteria under which to evaluate something, okay? And I don't want you to just look at security. So security, as we say, it often trades off with other things. Sometimes security trades off with security. So you have certain security properties and as you lock them down, it makes harder, it's harder to lock down other uh, security properties. So like an example would be, um, let's say I have my Bitcoin key, okay? So I have this like key that, that has all my Bitcoin, right? And I have to store it somewhere. And if someone gets access to it, uh, then they can steal all my Bitcoin. If I lose it, I lose all my Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin's not like a bank. There's no password resets. You can't go in person. It's like very unforgiving, right? Like either you have the key or you don't, okay? So like very simply, I might be like, I really, I'm scared of losing it. And like, not just like I'll misplace it, but like what if my house burns down and, and like the keys in the house or something like that, or there's a hurricane or something. So I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make 10 copies of the key. Okay, so I'm gonna make 10. I'm gonna have one in my office, one in my knapsack, one in at home, one in a safe. I'll give one to a friend, whatever, okay? So the more, the better, right? So if I wanna improve that like safety property, like I'm not gonna lose it, then the more keys I make, the better. Right now, the problem is the more keys I make, the more opportunity for them to get stolen. Right. If I have 10 of them, well, you just steal my knapsack and you have my key. Right. Or you break into my office and you have my key or my house. Take your pick, whatever one's easiest. Right. And so the more copies I have, then I'm like, OK, I only have to have one copy. Right. If I only have I can't have no copies, that would be the best. Right. But I, I have to have I just want one copy. I don't want to make a whole bunch of copies because I'm going to really protect that one copy. I'm going to put it in a safety deposit box at a bank or something like that. Okay, so that's a basic security trade-off, right? One security property, the fact that I'm scared I'm gonna lose it says make lots of copies of it. And another security property that says I don't want someone to steal it says don't make a lot of copies of it. Okay, now maybe there's some clever way you can think of like kind of to, to break that trade-off. But anyways, that's an example of security breaking off with security. But there's lots of other things that security break off or trades off with. Um, so deployability considerations. How much does it cost? Uh, what do you have to change? Do you need all your users to upgrade all their computers? You need them all to go out and buy a new device uh, that they're going to carry around with them, right? Um, usability, right? Uh, can a human actually use the system? Uh, do they know how to use it? Are they going to make errors uh, when they use it? Do they, do they have to memorize things? Uh, do they have to recognize that, oh, that looks weird, so I shouldn't do that, right? Do I have to read some error dialogue that's like, certificate domain name mismatch and know that that's actually a really serious thing or it's not a serious thing and I should just click ignore right like so what are you expecting uh, of your users and so what an evaluation framework does is you don't have to strictly break it along these three lines but it's pretty useful it, it, it I've seen it deployed in lots of different contexts for studying lots of different the security of lots of different things uh, where basically you have a security sometimes you have a privacy uh, depending on if if you consider those separate or, or together, but you have some sort of security criterias, uh, you have some usability uh, criterias, and then you have your deployability uh, criterias, okay? Uh, so you can do more than that, uh, but, but those three uh, tend to be quite sufficient. Okay, so when you're done, it would look kind of like this. Uh, so you would have just a little chart. The rows would be your three alternatives, and then you have some properties, uh, and then basically it would say whether it has that property or not. It's not any different than if you're, I don't know, say you're buying a car and, and you know, you go to your favorite dealership and then they give you a chart like this and they're like, okay, here's our car, here's the competitors, here's like three competitors. And then they, they're like, okay, this one has like six speed, but this other one's five speed or whatever. So, you know, the, the actual deliverable is not remarkable, right? It's, it's actually very simple to look at. It's easy to consume. Uh, but the hard work comes into choosing those properties correctly, making sure that you get all of them so you're comprehensive. Um, and uh, finding your alternatives, making sure they're truly alternatives, uh, things like that. Uh, so these are, are um, the kinds of things that, that, that get tricky. So a few tips before I show you a concrete example is uh, the properties, we always try to phrase them positively, meaning that you want to satisfy that property. So let's say that you're, I don't know, you have an intrusion detection system and it's not vulnerable to some attack, right? Uh, you could say, like, if you made a table like this, you might be like, okay, is it it's vulnerable to this attack. It's vulnerable to attack A, 
Okay? In that case, you wouldn't want the dots, right? You don't want your system uh, to be vulnerable to attack A. So then some of your properties, it's like you want the dot, and some of the properties, you don't want the dot because of the way that they're phrased. And then it's really hard if I just look at it and I'm like, like right now, if I, like alternative one looks good, right? It gets the most dots, right? Really simple, right? Uh, but, but if some of those are properties I don't want, then maybe getting a dot is a bad thing. Okay, so what you have to do is when you write your properties, you have to phrase them. It's just an English thing where you have to like kind of reverse the phrasing sometimes. But you're going to phrase them positively so that you, it's always phrased in terms of the dot is what you want, okay? So then visually, the more dots you see, the better it is generally, okay? Um, if you were to do this in assignment, theoretically, uh, I would expect an explanation of every dot, okay? And of every property. So what's a property? What does it take to get a full dot? What does it take to get a half dot? What does it take to get a no dot? And then for alternative three, why did you give it a full dot instead of a half dot? Okay. And generally, I don't care like so much about whether you get your dots exactly right or if I would do it, if I would come up with the same things as, as you would or things like that. I just want you to be consistent uh, and, and actually explain what you're doing. Uh, that, that tends to be the, the most important thing. Okay, um, Okay. so the next thing is this table is meant to be sort of neutral. Uh, it's not necessarily meant to sell you on alternative one as opposed to alternative three, right? It's really up to the reader to look at it and say, you know, alternative one gets all the, the, the most dots, but maybe property three is actually the most important property. Maybe I actually really care about property three. And so I actually like alternative three, even though it doesn't get as many dots as alternative one, that third property is just so important to me that, that I want alternative three because it has the full dot, okay? So your, your job isn't to sell someone on uh, which alternative they should choose. It's really to just say, okay, here's all the alternatives and here's the properties and it's very neutral. It's just like, do with it whatever you want, okay? We're just, I'm just telling you this, okay? Um, the, the kind of approach that you don't have to follow but, but usually works pretty nice is, yeah, if you give it a full dot, it achieves the property. Uh, if you doesn't achieve the property, you don't give it a dot. And then you can have some half dot, or I have a kind of empty circle as a, a half dot, uh, which basically says that it does achieve the property, kind of, but there's some caveats or there's some, you know, sort of half achieves it or whatever. And those ones, you have to be really careful. You have to really spell out, like, okay, what, what does it mean to get a half dot? Um, so yeah. Okay, so we're going to do uh, an example of this. Actually, we're, we're not going. To, we're going to do it, and then we're also going to look at a paper that did it much better than we're going to do in class. Okay, uh, so you'll see what we'll brainstorm our own uh, our own evaluation framework, so you can sort of get the feeling for how it goes. Then I'll show you what an academic paper evaluation framework would look like uh, in like a top tier uh, venue, and you'll you'll see that it's much more detailed. Uh, but, but you'll get the uh, kind of, um, you'll get the gist of it uh, from what we do in class. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, passwords uh, as our example. And uh, specifically what we're going to do is we're going to look at, uh, so this is meant to evaluate lots of different alternatives. Okay, so now uh, we have different alternatives to passwords. So passwords isn't the only way. Think about a website, right? The website wants you to log in. Uh, you can create a password. You can remember your password. Uh, ideally, with a password, you know, the security advice from the 1980s and 1990s is every single website, you have a different password. You know, it's a long, complicated password, and you remember it, and you never write it down. And so you have, you know, for all the 200 sites or 1,000 sites that you have, uh, uh, you have passwords for, you have a unique password for all of them, right? That was the old mental model. And maybe it worked in the internet where you would only log into five different sites, okay? But nowadays that just doesn't work, okay? And so people have said, oh, we have a solution to this, okay? We're gonna get rid of that password problem where I memorize every password that I have, okay? So what are some examples? You should, you should know lots of these. So, what are some examples of, of what you might do instead of instead of just saying create a new password for my website? OTP. Okay, OTP. So tell me what that is. Uh, one-time password. So before I'm logging to a website, so 
Okay, good. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to call that slightly, so OTP is a slightly different thing, but uh, what you describe is called two-factor authentication usually. Um, so uh, often it's, and what, what problem is it trying to solve? The problem it's trying to solve is just because you, someone's showing up and they have your password, but do I actually believe it's you, right? And so from a security perspective, if I can have more evidence that it's you, that would be great. And so two-factor is, well, um, in general, there's factors like what, something you know, something you are, something you have, right? And so if I can ask about something you have in addition to something you know, then I can be more confident than it's you. So I know you have a phone and you have a phone number, and so I'm going to, uh, generally I'm still going to ask for your password, but in addition, I'm going to send a text code, a code to, you know, over SMS to your phone, uh, and then you're going to tell me that, and then now I know you know your password and I know you have your phone, so I'm more confident that too. Yeah. So that's one where uh, the goal is really to increase the security. So two-factor increases security over a normal password. Does it make anything worse? Is it strictly better? Okay, so there could be some reliability issues with it. Okay, so you could lose your phone, so you might get locked out of your account. Does everyone have a phone? I mean, everyone in the room here probably has a phone, but does everyone in the world have a phone? Everyone who's on the internet? Not necessarily. Uh, is it, does it take, it's shorter to log in if you uh, have to do this two-factor authentication? If you have to log into 100 sites, would you rather do it with just a normal password or would you rather do it with two-factor authentication? Okay, so there's some usability trade-off uh, in terms of there. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions that we'll ask. Okay. Uh, OAuth? Uh, OAuth, okay, so explain it. So OAuth is where you have a, um, a service that authenticates you, uh, and then the service uh, vouches that you are who you are, that you say you are. Like no, open ID command. Okay, okay, yeah, so OAuth, open ID, these are open standards for that type of thing. I'll call it single sign-on. Uh, so that's that's a term that, that covers OAuth. Uh, so the more, um, yeah, so the example you might think of is like Facebook or Twitter. So like I go to, I download an app, it wants me to create an account. Instead of me creating a new username and password for this thing, I'll just log in through Facebook and then somehow Facebook will uh, authenticate this app within Facebook and then, uh, and then if I'm able to demonstrate that I can log into my Facebook account, then it will, uh, it will consider me to be me. Uh, in terms of logging in the into the site, so Apple, Google, you know, uh, lots of different uh, people, Twitter, uh, uh, provide that uh, kind of single site, and then there's OAuth and like ones that are built on open standards and things like that uh, as well as alternatives. Yeah, so that's that's another thing that, that people use. Password managers. Okay, password managers. Uh, so what's the what's the story with the password manager? I guess it's a software where it stores all the passwords that are related to a website or application to this user. Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, so password managers, um, uh, so it's going to store the passwords for you so you don't have to remember them. So that's, it's solving a usability problem for you. Um, is it better in terms of security? No, maybe someone may access. Okay, so if I get access to your password manager, then I have all your passwords, yeah. right? Uh, so, so that could be a, a, a breach. So, um, so there's a trade-off uh, in terms of, of that, but it's more convenient. Uh, password managers also do some fun things like, first off, they'll generate passwords for you so they're secure and they're random and long and uh, hard to brute force. Um, another thing is that, let's say I create an account on whatever, Google, and then I accidentally go to Google with three O's instead of two O's, and there's some like website pretending to be Google, my password manager will not fill that in. Even though me as a human, I'm tricked, I think it's the real Google and the interface looks like Google, the page looks like Google, everything looks like Google, the URL does not match. And so, and I don't remember my password because that's why I have a password manager. So I couldn't even type it in even if I remember it. And I can't get my password manager to type it in. And so maybe that saves me. Maybe I manually like unlock it in my password manager and then copy and paste it. But, but anyways, it, it could save me in that case. So yeah, things like that. Another thing, actually just to go back to single sign-on. Uh, so single sign-on sounds great, right? Instead of having one password, or sorry, instead of having a thousand passwords, you have one password. Right. Uh, once again, there's a concentration. So if I'm able to break your Google account, 
then I can get access to all of your websites. Is there any other things that you can think of where single sign-on would be worse uh, than just having passwords? So there's, those are the benefits, that's why it's better. So there's that concentration of, of your data in one place. So there's a single point of failure. So that's one main reason against it. Can anyone think of another reason against it? Uh, privacy, if you don't want Site B to know you have an account with Site A, then you can't use Site A to log into Site B? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so privacy is the other big one. So uh, it's, it's not just that Facebook knows that you have an account, but every single time you log into that account, Facebook knows it. So they know when you're logging in, uh, yeah, like they know that you're active uh, and all of that. So, so it, it's like very rich data uh, for, for them. And that's why, that's why you see Google and Apple and Facebook offer these services, because it's not free, right? They have to put up servers. Their servers have to connect to other things. Those things might be super popular. It might be a lot of bandwidth, okay? It's not free for, for Google to do that. Uh, so why are they doing that? Well, they're, they're making money somewhere. Right, and so they're they're building a digital dossier of the kinds of apps that you want to use, and also frequency, time of use, uh, and those kinds of things, and that's that's valuable information to them. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so both of those are, are good things. So uh, first thing, hardware tokens. Uh, so you might have some like physical kind of thing. Uh, in some cases, your primary authentication. So you just, you have the, like I have a card, an RFID card, right? And it lets me into the wing of my office. Uh, and so if I have the, if you take the card from me, it's in my pocket, uh, you can take it, you can go into my office. Uh, so that's, that's it. Um, sometimes it's combined with uh, two-factor authentication. So like one common, uh, commonly used token is uh, called an RSA token. Uh, and so this is like something that shows you, it's the same thing like when you get a message, a text message with a random number, but now it's a hardware device that's on your keychain. And so you push a button, it gives you a number, and then when you log in, you log in with your password and you put that number in as well. Uh, and then that serves as something you have in addition to something you know. And then, there's, so there's something you know that would be like a password Maybe it's a master password for a password manager, or it's just you know all, you, the thousand passwords that you've memorized. Uh, there's something you have, like a phone or a token. And then the third category is something you are, and so that's where biometrics comes in. So uh, it could be a fingerprint, uh, it could be an iris scan. Um, those are, are the two most common ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, biometrics, uh, just generally before we go into a deep dive on it, like w are they better or worse than passwords? Okay, so like why, why are they better? They are better in certain regards. What's, why are they better? Okay, so they're harder to lose. Now, can you lose your fingerprint? And then what happens, right? So I cut your finger off and then I go around. I, don't know. I can lift your fingerprint, right? If you're touching something, I can lift it and make a synthetic 3D printed uh, finger that has your fingerprint on it. Um, so, so yeah, but anyways, that, that was the thinking. They're very convenient, right? You just, like my computer has a fingerprint reader. It's a lot easier than typing a password in. Uh, my phone has facial recognition. It's a lot, actually I wouldn't say it's easier, especially now with COVID and we're all wearing masks. It's, it's, you're always putting your password in anyways. Um, but yeah, yeah, so, so there is usability improvements, uh, definitely. Uh, is it more secure? So maybe, maybe not. So I'm going to argue that it's actually easier. It depends on how you're generating your passwords, but I'll argue that generally passwords have more entropy, which is the sort of critical uh, component uh, than biometrics do. At least biometrics. The problem with biometrics is you can pull a lot of data off a fingerprint, but then it's also very sensitive to like any changes. Like the more data that you pull, like the, the more precise you are about the fingerprint, you're expecting that level of precision the next time and the next time in a year from now, right? So if you have a sort of fuzzy matching to the fingerprint, then it's very robust. It's unlikely to change. It's unlikely that the same person's going to come back five years later and their fingerprint will look different because you're not looking very precisely at every like nook and cranny of the fingerprint. On the other hand, you can, you can make it very precise but then you know you could get just a scratch on your skin, or 
you know, the, the surface of your skin changes. I don't know, there's, there's lots of different ways where little things that could change and then it's very sensitive to it, right? Uh, it's very picky. So that's another sort of security with security trade-off. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So that's a really nice example of. Um, so that's something that's like so nuanced that even in the academic paper, I don't think they had a good category that captured that. Uh, but that's certainly an aspect as well. And that's what I want you to think of is these really long tail examples of, of things like. So in this case, it's a privacy consideration, basically, of whether you can compel it. It's also just like mechanically, can you compel it? Like if I'm police, I can take your fingerprint, but I can't force you to say it. Maybe I can torture you or something, but. Um, I can't just directly like pull it out of your brain. Uh, yeah, so coercion resistance uh, would be what I would call that property. And, and so yeah, different ones could have different properties along that line. Um, okay, any, any other uh, kinds of passwords that you've seen? Say again? Yeah, okay, perfect. So we call these graphical passwords. So instead of remembering a string of alphanumerical characters and special characters, you remember something visual, right? So the, the main thing is the, the swipe pa pattern on Android. Um, there, there have been lots of experiments where people will like show you pictures. Like when you set your password, they'll show you like two pictures and you'll pick one. And then they'll show you another two pictures and you'll pick one of the two. And then you do that like with 10 pictures, right? And then when you log in, they show you two pictures and you have to pick the exact same pictures. Or you know, there's, there's pictures and you pick them in certain orders. And there is some promising usability studies that show that it's easier to remember this uh, than it is to remember uh, like alphanumeric uh, characters. And so uh, yeah, so that was sort of a hot research area. It didn't really kind of take off uh, with the exception of, uh, I guess, the Android uh, unlock pattern. That's like probably the only graphical password. Sometimes it's used, I've seen it in, um, it's used more as an anti-phishing thing. So after you log in, they show you a picture that you set ahead of time. And if you don't see that picture, then you're supposed to say, oh, this might not be the real website. Although, of course, at that point, it's kind of too late. You already gave the password uh, to it. But um, anyways, I've seen it more in that context. But yeah, I haven't seen like a true graphic password used in a while. But, but anyways, that's, that's an interesting thing. So um, usability may be improved. Uh, there's some, some studies, scientific studies, that, that seem to suggest it. Uh, it's pretty fast, OK? Uh, what are the drawbacks? Uh, first off, it's a physical action. So if you're not capable of doing that physical action, um, probably if you could type a password in, uh, then you could also do the swipe pattern. If you, like, say you had a disability uh, or something like that that prevented you, um, you could maybe speak uh, it in or, or something like that or use assistive technology. Um, uh, so, but, but anyways, uh, you also can't do that kind of thing um, it's, well, it's easy on a phone to do like a swipe pattern. It's harder on a computer. So it's maybe not as portable across devices. Um, there's also weird attacks like smudge attacks where like I pick up your phone and I see like a certain smudge mark because you've unlocked it 10 times in the last hour and you haven't wiped your phone. And so I can infer. And if I throw machine learning or something at the, at the pattern, I can, there are like papers that show that you can very easily determine what someone's password is. So anyways, yeah. There's uh, different uh, considerations, but graphical passwords is one that we'll consider. Uh, anything else that anyone can think of? Ultrasonic uh, fingerprinting. S sorry? Ultrasonic fingerprinting. Address only? Ultrasonic, yeah. Ultrasonic. Ultra okay, sorry, it's but. It's biometric. Oh, it's a biometric. Okay, okay. I don't know about that, but yeah, okay. So we'll put that under biometrics as well. There's also a plis implicit authentication, which is sort of like how you type, like say you're typing and uh, like the way I type is slightly different than the way you type. 
and uh, the way I hold the phone and things like that, or like when I swipe it, I sort of rotate the phone in certain areas. So that sometimes is used, usually it's not used as a strict authentication, but it might be like, say I've authenticated to the phone and it's unlocked, but now the phone is deciding when it should go back to sleep. And so as long as I'm continuing to use it and it, my ma like biometrics match my sort of history, it's less likely to put it to sleep and ask for a password again. But if the biometrics go really weird, then it will just say, okay, you need to log in again, kind of thing. Um, so, so that, yeah, there are some solutions along. Uh, what about the trust this device option? Like uh, yeah, I've heard that term as like a marketing term, but what does it actually mean? Like, like you log into an application or something and, and it gives you an option to like, this device for like 10 days of period. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's not a, an alternative to passwords. It's, it's an extension of passwords, I guess. So it is, um, it's stopping you from putting your password in and so much, but at the same time, you still, the password is the primary authentication mechanism. Yeah, yeah, so there's the question of once you've done a password, biometric, hardware token, two-factor, then how long do you stay logged in? And if all of a sudden I'm coming from a different IP address, Maybe Google makes me re-authenticate even though I said I want to stay logged in for 30 days or, or things like that. Um, so yeah, so th those are all important decisions. And you could do an evaluation framework of all those alternatives as well. But they're not strict alternatives to passwords themselves. Anything else? Okay, so your list is exactly the same as the list that, uh, that we came up with. Uh, in past years, with one exception. So there's one that usually no students come up with because it's no one actually uses them. Um, but uh, I'll throw it into the mix as well. Uh, sometimes you have, actually I, I gave a good example with the Bitcoin keys. So the Bitcoin keys is like actually a cryptographic file. Uh, sometimes there's a protocol called SSL or TLS and you have like a client certificate that authenticates you. Um, sometimes it's used in email, so like say you're in an organization and you're going to sign your emails, then you need to have like some sort of certificate, which is a digital file, which basically signs off on your key saying it's, it's your, really your key. And then all your emails, they automatically get signed. But the point is it's like a digital file that's on your computer. And that's what's going to authenticate you. Isn't that kind of a form of having something? Of which? Of having something? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it's absolutely not, and so this is actually a good point to, to emphasize. A cryptographic key you can't memorize. Or at least you're not going to memorize two or three of them. Maybe maybe you could memorize one of them if you're lucky, but you're not going to memorize two or three of them. So it's absolutely something you have as opposed to something you know. So it's a file, it's on your computer, and if you want to log in from multiple computers, you're going to have to make a copy of that file and, and port it over. Um, so you can start to see the usability. The usability pros is that you don't have to do anything. You just go to the website and you're automatically logged in because your certificate's sitting in your browser and the browser went and grabbed it and that's it, right? Uh, yeah, so YubiKey is like a hardware token version of that as well, yeah, yeah. So we could put YubiKeys into this uh, same category of like you have some sort of cryptographic key and it's, it's a file or a device, it's on a hardware device or something like that. Uh, in Bitcoin you have like YubiKey kind of things like, like little hardware uh, USB things that you stick in and, and they have all your keys and stuff like that. But anyways, um, why are they yeah. uh, okay, so why are they unpopular? So what are the drawbacks? Uh, so the first thing is you lose it, you're done. Uh, so with a password, you can at least reset it or there's some party that, that has control of it. Um, the second thing is it's, uh, um, well, okay, if it's token based, it's expensive. Right, so you have to provision it. If it's just a digital file, like in terms of certificates, usually you need someone to sign off on the certificate, and so you have to involve them, and there's this sort of like enrollment phase uh, where they, they learn who you are and what your key is, and you prove that you actually are. So usually you can't just get a certificate, because and I could pretend to be you getting your certificate, right? So you have to bootstrap the whole process with um, uh, another process where you actually prove who you are then they're like, okay, this is the right key for you. Then you can go ahead and, and use it. So the registration or enrollment thing could be more expensive. It might involve like a cost. Um, and then uh, the, the device portability is the other one that, that probably kills it, which is that uh, I have my certificates on my computer, but now I pick up my phone and I can't log in. So maybe instead of being popular like in the 
large scale uh, consumer world, maybe it could be more useful in some more governmental application. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So this is something you see in corporate. It is actually used in corporate use. Um, it could be as simple as even SSHing into a server, mm -hmm. right? So I SSH from my computer to another server, and I have a key on my my server that authenticates me uh, to the other to the other server. So instead of putting a password in, I just type SSH, hit enter, and then boom, it happens, kind of thing. Um, so that's used. It's used in SMIME, which is corporate email, mm -hmm. in terms of keys, signing email, uh, client certificates, HTTPS certificates, client side certificates. I think are used. They, anyways, 10 years ago, they were used more in government. I don't know how much they're used today, but yeah. Um, I have an example where uh, I have a VPN server running at my, my home, um, but although I have access from my devices, there's also a couple other people I've given access to, a friend of mine sort of thing, but I didn't want to have to manage giving each person a different certificate and then giving uh, having to revoke certificates if something gets lost or compromised and stuff. So I did uh, one single certificate to anyone who had the right to log in, but also enabled a username and password login where everyone gets their own username and password. So you had to get the right certificate first and then the username and password second, and that stops just anyone on the internet from trying to get into my system because they don't have the certificate but also minimizes the certificate management that I had to do in order to, to support that. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, so that's a nice solution. And so that would be classified as two-factor authentication because it's something you know and something you have. It's a little different because usually the thing you have is unique to you and the thing that you know is also unique. In this case, you have a universal thing to have and then a unique. Yeah. So it's like a custom bespoke yeah. like kind of approach, but that's cool, it's interesting. Okay, so uh, anyway, these are the eight alternatives uh, that we came up with. And we sort of talk through maybe some of the trade-offs that are involved in terms of their security and their usability. So next class, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get formal with it. So we'll write down the actual properties where we think that there's differences uh, between these in terms of security, usability, costs, uh, whatever, privacy. Uh, and then we'll try and put it together in an evaluation framework. And then, like I said, I'll show you an, an actual example of what it might look like if you spent three months doing this project instead of uh, spending one lecture doing it. Okay, so uh, that's it. Any final questions? Okay, so I'll see you all next week. Hopefully we'll have the full text set up working.